You can have a seat, and uh, I'd invite you to take your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 is our text today. And if you do not have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, and I just encourage you to grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you, turn to page uh, 1,162, page 1,162, and you will be able to join with us, follow along with us in Ephesians chapter 5. Love for you to do that. And as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, please take one with you. It is our gift to you. We want you to have God's Word and read God's Word. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please ask for one. We'd be glad to get you one because we want everyone to have a, a Bible because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, can I, can I just echo something that uh, uh, Pastor Daryl shared earlier? And that is that on June 4th at 6 o'clock, we're going to be celebrating lake baptisms down at London Bridge Beach, which is across the, the bridge. I think you guys know which bridge I'm talking about. And uh, <laughs> turn left at the first left right there, uh, you know, at the Mexican restaurant and just go on down there past the dog park. We're going to be there. We're going to be celebrating life change and, and if you have made that commitment to follow Jesus with your life and you've never declared that publicly, can we just encourage you to do that? Now, I mean, this is between you and God. We're just the ones who want to help facilitate that. We just want to be the ones who help you be obedient to Jesus. But if you've never done that, uh, we would love to celebrate that. I mean, it's a great setting. I mean, there's boats coming by. There's people out there just uh, doing whatever they're going to do on a Sunday afternoon. And we get to declare Jesus has changed our lives again and again and again. So uh, if that's something you're interested in doing, grab a Connect card right now, put your information on there, put Lake Baptism. Uh, we'll add you to the list. We'll follow up with you on that. And it's a party that I love every year uh, being a part of. So hey, happy Mother's Day weekend. I know, it's Mother's Day tomorrow, right? You guys get that? And, and, but but it's, it's still the weekend for us. So it's all the, all the same. So can I just say for the record, I'm thankful for moms. I'm thankful for my mom. I'm thankful for my wife. I'm thankful for my daughters and watching them be moms and do the mom thing with excellence. And since we are continuing our Kingdom Relationship series, we decided to preach on one of the most controversial and inflammatory passages about marriage on Mother's Day weekend. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know, I'm not always the wisest one, but uh, then again, Scripture is what it is. So uh, this passage shares God's wisdom on how to have a wonderful marriage. And, and the thing is, the truths that we're going to look at are going to apply to every single relationship that you have. So uh, even if you're not married, I hope that you will get a lot out of this. Now, I'm going to preface this before I read the passage. Uh, I just want you to remember that marriage was God's idea, is God's idea. And he gave it to us to bless us. And, and his plan to bless us was one man, one woman, one lifetime. All right, that was God's plan for blessing us. And of course, we messed it up. We rebelled and we invited evil into this world and that evil impacts our marriages and all of our relationships. And, and so uh, that's our reality. And, and I'm just gonna tell you there's wisdom in doing life and marriage and relationships God's way. And he'll tell us the wisdom. It's up to us whether or not we're gonna actually uh, live it out and embrace it. So Ephesians 5, beginning at verse 22 and the Apostle Paul writes, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Please don't stop listening now. We have more to say. <laughs> For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself, is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband." 
Now, I want to begin with uh, some disclaimers, okay? And, uh, and I literally put that in your sermon notes because I want you to hear these. I feel like uh, you need these disclaimers so that you can listen to the rest of the message. So I want you to hear these disclaimers and, uh, because they're important for us to understand this passage and the, just the implications that it has because it is controversial because there are people who want to strike it from Scripture. There are people who want to abuse it because it's in Scripture. And I want us to understand it the way I believe God intended us to hear it. So uh, the first disclaimer is simply this. Marriage is not about control or power. Marriage is not about control. And, and, and if you think that it is, you fail in marriage. If you think that marriage is about controlling the other person... Uh, having power over the other person, then you and your spouse are going to be in a loveless and mean relationship. This passage is not given for one spouse to control another, uh, which uh, I hope, hopefully will put some of you ladies at ease that kind of bristle at the whole submission term that is in there because, uh, you know, it has been used to try to control people and control women in, in marriage. It's not about that. Marriage is not about control or power. So hear that. Second disclaimer. Ephesians 5.22 is only for women. Hey, tell me something. What is the first word in verse 22 in your Bibles? Wives. Yeah, it's two wives. That means if you're not a wife, that means husbands, just shut up. Okay? I, I mean, I don't know if to say this, it, this verse is for the wife. It's not for you. So if you guys, if you ever say to your wife, the Bible tells you to submit, woman, you're in sin. You're in sin. You're, you're wrong. In that, in that moment, you are absolutely and unequivocally not where God wants you to be because you go back up to that first disclaimer. You are trying to win the moment. You're trying to control your wife. You're trying to exert power in the relationship. And marriage is not about control or power. So this verse is directed at wives and they have to choose how they are going to respond to God. So Ephesians 5.22 is only for women. Ephesians 5.25 is only for men. So what's the first word in Ephesians 5, 25? Husbands. Husbands, right. So who does it apply to? Husbands, right. So uh, that means, ladies, please stay silent. Please, I, look, I'm a guy, I can be rude to the guys, okay? Just, I mean, if you are nagging your husband about him not loving you like Jesus, then you are in sin. If you reference this verse trying to get him to act a different way or respond a different way, then you have crossed the line and you are trying to control or exercise power over your husband in that situation. So uh, are we good with the disclaimers? Some of you are like, don't you have more? No. No, but if we're good with the disclaimers, then we can, you know, dive into the, re the passage and, and kind of talk about what it actually means to our lives. So are we good with the disclaimers? We understand those? Yes. Okay, good, because they're important to understand as we walk through this. Because of the abuse and the disregard for the passage because of the words that are used. Now, I'm going to start with the men because God said they're the leaders and they're the first responsible party uh, in this passage. So, uh, men, I'm starting with you. Even though uh, Paul started with the ladies, God said you're supposed to be leading them, so you're going first. So, men, husbands, decide to sacrifice for your wife. Uh, I already read it. I'm going to read it again. Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Christ died for the church. He died to save us from our sin. He sacrificed his body. He sacrificed his life so that we could live. So to love like Jesus is to give yourself for your wife. All right, guys, I'm gonna put you on the spot. If you're married and your wife's sitting next to you, uh, I, I know how you're gonna answer this question. So, uh, but I'm still gonna ask you because I, I think the answer is, is probably true. How many of you would die trying to protect your wife and family? Okay, 
Guys all raise their hand. Of course, if you're next to your wife, you have to, I know. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I don't think you're like that, that lady that was like, you know, poisoning her husband or whatever and uh, trying to write about grief. But uh, so here's the thing. If you're prepared to die protecting your wife and your family, then why don't you choose to live sacrificially for your wife and your family? See, we think it's manly. Oh, I'm going to die for my wife. Yeah, I'm going to die for my family. All right, if you're man enough to die for them, then why don't you be man enough to live for them, which means choosing a life of sacrifice for your wife and for your family, which means that you stop being selfish. And, and you guys are like, okay, I want to stop being selfish. How do I do that? Let me be really practical here. How, if you want to stop being selfish, if you want to live a life sacrificing for your wife, loving your life, wife like Christ loved the church, then I'm going to give you three action steps, and I'm going to challenge you to implement all of them this week. Okay? They're, they're not easy, but you can do them. Okay? Number one, pray for your wife. Pray for your wife. I'd encourage you to pray for, for your wife and with your wife and if you pray with your wife, it's going to draw you guys closer together. Now, there, there's a lot of you guys who are like, I'm not going to pray out loud. Man up, okay? Just go ahead and say, the preacher told me to do this, I'm going to do this. So tonight when you get home, just you know, kind of grab her, her hand and say, I'm going to pray for you. And, and you know, that, that'll, that alone will like change the relationship. But when you pray for I need to kind of coach you a little bit because I want you to pray for it in a specific way. First thing is, don't pray for God to fix her. Okay, even when you're alone, don't pray for God to fix her. Okay, don't pray for God to, to make her nicer or make her, you know, you know uh, like you better or change her so that you like her better or anything like that. That's not how you pray for your wife, Okay. With your wife listening, I challenge you, pray asking God to help you be a better husband. Just simply say, God, help me to be the husband that you created me to be. Help me to love my wife better tomorrow than I did today. Okay? Ask, ask, say, dare to ask, God, help me to love her like Jesus. Okay? Just go ahead and do that. And if you do that and you mean it, because you can't just like use the words and still be a jerk, okay? But if you... If you pray it and you mean it, it's going to change your relationship. Just that one thing. Okay, just that one thing. So if you want to not be selfish, if you want to love your wife like Jesus, love the church, if you want to be, you know, sacrifice for your wife, pray for your wife. Guys, can you think you can do that? Yeah. Of course you can. The question isn't whether you can. The question is will you? So first of all, pray for your wife. Secondly, serve your wife. Okay? Jesus served the church. He sacrificed for the church. And the only way to be less selfish is to serve more. Okay, it, it just makes sense, okay? That's why Jesus told us to be servants. The only way to be less selfish is to serve more. And that means help with chores. I really thought there'd be a chorus of amens from the wives right now. <laughs> but help with chores. I mean, come on. Look, I... I, I do dishes sometimes, not often enough, but I do dishes. I clean toilets. I mean, I make the bigger mess. I might as well do it. Uh, <laughs> chances are, guys, you're with me on that. So, I mean, it's just, you know, help out. I take out the trash without being asked. So, uh, you know, brownie points. So, I mean, just help out. I mean, it's not like it's not, it's, oh, it's her job. No, serve your wife. Be active with the children or the grandchildren. Help her out. Do what helps her. After all, Jesus said, whoever wants to be great must be the servant of everyone. Guess what? Everyone starts at home with your wife. So men, do you want to be great husbands? <laughs> There's not, they're like, I, I, I know where you're going with this. I'm not so sure. Can I just be solid, you know, instead of great? No, if you want to be a great husband then serve your wife. It boils down to that. So pray for your wife, serve your wife, and men, if you want to love your wife like Jesus loved the church, then stop comparing your wife. Stop comparing your wife to other women. Okay, so I'm, I'm just going to ask this. Guys, please answer this. Were any of you guys in this room forced to marry the woman you're, you're married to? Okay, none, none of you were forced. Okay, there were no guns involved. 
There were no arrangements involved. In other words, you chose to marry her. In fact, you stood before at least, you know, a judge and two witnesses, if not more people, and promised to love her and cherish her and honor her and keep her in sickness and health, richer for poorer, better or worse until death do you part. That's what you said. So you chose her, since you chose her, delight in her. And you can't do that if you're comparing her to other women. Delight in your wife, which means... Um, By the way, just for the record, pornography is comparing your wife to unrealistic fantasy. It's just comparing her. You got no chance at loving your wife like Christ loved the church if you're engaged in pornography. So if you love your wife, repent of your pornography use. And and I know that every guy in here that struggles with this, which pretty much is every guy in here, uh, then, then you, at this point, you're like, it's, it's getting real. And you go, well, okay, I didn't do that, but I'm going to repent secretly so nobody knows that I actually struggle with this. And you're going to fail again because you repent a lot and you still fail. Can I just encourage you to, like, you know, download uh, or go to the website for triplexchurch.com or Covenant Eyes? They actually have, you know, like Bible studies and support groups that you can get in for, you know, helping you to overcome your porn addiction. Can I encourage you to, you know, be brave enough to sign up for one of the men's life groups and, and get real with some guys that they can help you with that struggle? Can I encourage you to be brave enough to show up at Celebrate Recovery Monday night at 6.30 in this room? Because they understand addiction and they will help you and they're not embarrassed that by the fact that you're, uh, you know, real like everybody else, that even though you've been redeemed, you're still struggling. So, uh, you know, just repent and ask God to, to help you do that. But you got to put some actions with it. And by the way, guys, checking out other women is demeaning and unfair to your wife. Because honestly, even if you think you found the perfect woman who is everything your wife is not, if you think, oh, I found her and she's smart and she's beautiful and she's fun and she thinks that you're terrific, she even laughs at your lame jokes. Um... You need to stop comparing your wife to her and realize that somewhere there is a guy thanking God that that perfect woman is no longer in his life. Okay, that's reality. You only think she's perfect because you don't live with her, all right? Look, man, you chose your wife. So love her like Jesus and watch your relationship blossom. It will just become incredible if you'll dare to Obey God. Okay. Hey, ladies, did you like what you heard so far? Good, because you're next. (laughs) All right, so ladies, women, practice submission to your husband. See, all the fun went out of the room right now. I had to get to that verse, didn't he? I mean, the Apostle Paul wrote, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. I didn't write it. Don't be mad at me. I am reading it publicly, but don't be mad at me. It's in the Bible. It's there. And by the way, um, you have to practice it because it doesn't come natural. I mean, we're rebellious people. And so choosing to submit to your husband is not something that you're naturally going to do. And before you protest this challenge that is biblical... Please understand that submission is for all followers of Jesus. Submission is for all followers of Jesus. So if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and if you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then submission is part of your lifestyle. You need to practice submission as a follower of Jesus. First of all, you submit to Jesus as Lord. And the pain and suffering that we keep having in our lives is largely because we didn't submit to Jesus. We're doing things our own way, not God's way. And then we're all supposed to submit to one another. Did you know that? Did you look at verse 21, the one right before, the one you don't like? It says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Do you know what that means? That means all of us need to lead people and all of us need to be led. There are none of us that are like, I don't have to submit to anybody. 
See, I mean, again, submission is part of the Christian walk. We all, if you're a follower of Jesus, you submitted to Jesus. You said, Jesus, you have control of my life. I will do what you say. I am yours. Okay? That, I mean, that's reality. So submission is for all followers of Jesus. Now, God's plan for marriage involves a loving, serving husband who submits to and follows Jesus and a loving, serving wife who follows his lead. Again, we're talking about God's plan we know we've messed that up. But in doing this, in choosing submission, ladies, you are recognizing God's authority, not your husband's. Your husband does not have authority over you. What you're doing is you're recognizing that God has authority over you and you want to listen to God, you want to obey God, and you want to do what he says uh, according to scripture. Now, you might be reluctantly submitting or you might be joyfully submitting, but the one that you're submitting to is Jesus. You're obeying Jesus. Now, husbands, I, I got to throw this uh, part of it. If you're a spiritual leader who loves Jesus and serves well, your wife's going to have zero issues with this verse. Okay, I'm just telling you guys, if, if, you're, if you're like, yeah, I I'm, I'm love Jesus and I'm serving well and, uh, you know, it's not going to be an issue. But it, it, husbands, if your wife won't follow your lead, you need to ask yourself Why? You need to ask yourself, how am I leading her and where am I leading her? Because if you're leading her away from Jesus, she's not going to submit to you. Again, she's obeying Jesus, and if you're trying to lead her away from Jesus, if you're trying to lead her uh, into a lifestyle that rejects Jesus or ignores Jesus or has other gods, she's not going to follow you there. That's not biblical for her to follow you there. So you need to ask yourself, oh, why isn't she uh, choosing to submit? Why isn't she following my lead? Because that's really what submission is. So wives, uh, understand your husband has to give an account to God for how he leads you. You have to give an account to God for how you obeyed him. That's how this works. All of us have to give an account to God for the things that he has commanded us to do. So you're recognizing God's authority, not your husband. And then, ladies, your husband needs your help to succeed. See, in my notes, I, I added the word desperately. <laughs> your husband desperately needs your help to succeed. Uh, in Genesis chapter 2, in paradise, before we had brought sin into the world, it, it says this, The Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Can we just agree that, uh, you know, uh, marriage was a blessing from God because it's not good that the man is alone. Most of us are, are pathetic at some level uh, alone. And, uh, and I just speak that because that's my confession. And so as husbands and wives, God designed us to complement each other, have different roles, equal value. Different roles, equal standing before Christ. So ladies, your husband needs you. So I am the, the man that I am, uh, leading a, a growing, thriving ministry of life change because my wife, Merelda, we've been married almost 39 years, has made it possible for me to succeed. I, I'm just going to be really blunt about that. This, this is not like a one-man show. I, I could not do this without her help. She is a helper fit for me. And if you don't know my wife, Merelda, she is submissive but she is not quiet, okay? I mean, she will challenge me, she will encourage me, she will clothe me, I am wearing pink. She, she will take care of me, and she will follow me, but not always joyfully submissive, okay? Can I just be honest about it? She's not always joyfully submissive, but she'll, you know, let me know where she thinks that I could do better, and, but she'll still follow so ladies, if you want your husband to succeed, he will need your help in many ways. And, and you definitely want him to succeed because, and this is for couples and really for everybody, if you want success, choose to bless. If you want success in life, 
choose to bless. If you want success in your marriage, choose to bless. If you want success in your relationships with anybody, from your children to your parents to your siblings to your friends to your coworkers to your neighbors, then choose to bless. If you desire a healthy, thriving, successful marriage, just decide you're gonna bless one another. Ephesians 5.28, and I love this verse. He simply says, at the end of the verse, he who loves his wife loves himself. He who loves his wife loves himself. What is the Apostle Paul saying? He's talking about biblical reciprocity for your marriage. Now, if you don't remember biblical reciprocity, it's just simply you reap what you sow. You're gonna reap what you sow. The Apostle Paul put it this way in Galatians 6. He says, don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked. For whatever you sow, that is what you're gonna reap. And if you sow to the flesh, you're from the flesh, you're gonna reap destruction. And if you sow to the spirit, from the spirit, you're gonna reap eternal life. Okay, that's reality. You're gonna reap the good or you're gonna reap the bad. You're gonna reap all of it. Whatever you sow is what you're gonna reap. Does that make sense to you? Okay, so if that's the case, if you want success, choose to bless means that you need to choose to love. Choose to love. Okay, how many of you want to be loved? Okay. If you didn't raise your hand, I want to see you after the service. <laughs> it's like, I got too much love in my life, I don't want to be loved. I want to be left alone. Okay, look, if you want to be loved, love. See, the problem is a lot of times we're like, I'm, I'm hungry for love and I want someone to love me, but we don't actually take the initiative to love people. And the same is true in our marriage. And I'm not talking about your feelings, you know, falling in, falling out, all that kind of stuff. I'm not, I'm not talking about it at all. I'm talking about the decision to love your spouse in a biblical way. By the way, I, I, it's a whole other sermon, but love is not a feeling. Love is a decision that you make to treat people the way that Jesus treated people. Okay, so you're like, well, I'm not in love. Well, you can be in love if you choose to love. If, if the love is, is growing cold in your relationship, even if it's like your, you know, your, your love right now is like, you know, freezer level, God can change that if you choose to love. If you choose to love. Now, by the way, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, tells us what love looks like. Like, not, not a ooey-gooey feeling inside, but what it actually looks like. And it starts off this way. Love is patient, and love is kind. Are you patient with your spouse? <laughs> Suddenly, nobody wants to confess. <laughs> Don't you like that? Everybody's like, yes, talking, amen, yeah, and everything. is like, are you patient with your spouse? Crickets. Nobody really wants to say anything. Why? Because it, it is Paul, the apostle, reminding us how we don't love like Jesus loves. And we're like, God, I want a good marriage. Then be patient with your spouse. I don't want to do that. <laughs> then you're not going to have a good marriage. Hey, God, I want to have good relationships with people. Then be patient with people. I don't want to do that. Then you're not going to have great relationships with people. I mean, this is as simple as it gets. And then he goes on, love is kind. Are you kind toward your spouse? <laughs> Some of you are like, most of the time, <laughs> occasionally. Look, it is so easy to be unkind. It's so easy to stop being polite and saying please and thank you. It's so easy to get comfortable being rude and sniping with those little comments and stuff like that. And yet love is kind. And if the people who don't know you think you're kind, but the people who know you don't, you're not being very loving in your relationships. Um, so if you want to be treated with patience and kindness, then repent and love. So choose to love and you'll receive love. And then choose to listen. Choose to listen. You may not have thought that would make the top of the list uh, here when I'm talking about this, but for most couples that are actually trying to have a good marriage, uh, I think communication is about 90% of conflict. We just don't communicate. We don't communicate our plans. We don't communicate our dreams. We don't communicate our expectations. We don't communicate our frustrations. 
And then when we try to communicate, many of us are just immune to our wife, our wife or husband's voice. Right? You guys know what I'm talking about? We just, just don't hear each other at all anymore. I mean, sorry, Ral, but uh, if Meralda is on her phone or watching TV, she is in the cone of silence. I mean, I can be standing there two feet away asking her a question. She is not going to answer until the phone goes down or we hit a commercial break and the Hallmark movie, which she already knows how it ends, is not playing. Okay? It just, it, it just it's, there's no communication. And I'm just as guilty because if I'm reading something online or I'm playing words with friends, she can talk to me and I hear there's noise, but I don't hear a word she's saying. See, we're all guilty of this, and we don't listen to the people that are closest to us that we need to be talking with, we need to be communicating with. And and look, we can be honest, it's not just our spouses, it's relationships that we have because we're not paying attention. James chapter 1, the apostle says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger, for the anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness that God desires. Most of us are slow to listen, quick to speak, and quick to anger, and then we wonder why we struggle in relationships. I mean, I'm going to put that on the top ten verses that husbands and wives need to memorize. You know, love is patient, love is kind is a great start. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger is a good place to go. Just use it as a rule. Are you listening before you get angry? Are you listening before you try to argue? So just listen. Can can we just, if you want to have a a great marriage, you want to bless your spouse, then listen. Put down your phone or your tablet. Turn off the TV or the video game and hear each other. Intentionally build communication into your life. So choose to love, choose to listen, and choose to forgive. Your spouse is probably the most offensive person in your life. Right? I mean, because you're with them more. They're there when you're, you know, the, all, all the, you know, niceties are down and you're at your best and your worst and all this kind of stuff and they're there and you wake up in the morning and they're a morning person and you're not a morning person and they make noise and you don't get mad and, you know, or they're a night person and, and you're not a night person. They're going, you're going to bed and they're still making it. It's just all this stuff. They have more opportunities to offend you so just decide you're going to practice forgiveness toward your spouse because it will bless you and it will bless your marriage. First of all, it will bless you because if you're keeping score, if you're tracking offenses, if you're harboring anger, it's going to destroy you and your marriage or any relationship actually because you are, being the, are the one who is being unloving. Do, do you get that? You're the one who's being unloving. Again, 1 Corinthians 13 describing love says love isn't resentful or love keeps no record of wrongs. <laughs> that just changes a lot of arguments in here, doesn't it? <laughs> love keeps no record of wrongs. It doesn't bring up the past. It's not reminding you of how you failed before. So forgive. Live life choosing to forgive. In fact, decide to forgive before they offend you. A couple weeks ago, I talked about this. You know, practice preemptive grace or premeditated mercy. Just decide every day, I'm going to forgive before they offend me. Because it frees your soul and it allows you to live in blessing. So if you want success, choose to bless. Choose to love, choose to listen, choose to forgive. I could go, keep going, but, you know, there's an end to the service. See, God desires your marriage, your relationships to thrive and be healthy So if you want success, choose to bless. I hope you actually remember that throughout the week and decide you're going to bless more and more and more and more. Because God really does want to bless you, and he wants to bless me, and he wants to bless our homes, and he wants to bless our marriages, and he wants to bless our friendships, and he wants to bless our work relationships. All of it, if we'll choose to listen to his wisdom. Now, if you're married or if you're uh, planning on getting married and you're with your, uh, the one you're betrothed to, uh, would you just reach over and grab their hand right now? Because I want to pray for us 
I pray for all of us, but I especially want to pray for our marriages and our relationships. Father, thank you that you love us. Thank you that you teach us even what we don't want to learn. Uh, we need your wisdom. We are, are so broken in our relationships. We struggle so much in our marriages. And, and we need you to help us to learn how to be the husbands and wives that you created us to be. God, we need to, to take your word seriously and practice blessing because we're gonna reap what we sow. And we need to start in our homes with the people that we pledged publicly to love and cherish and hold on to. So God, just meet us in this moment right now and, and heal the hurt. Start to, to restore relationships. Right now, there's some couples right now holding hands who, who really don't wanna be holding hands. God, I pray that you would change hearts and minds. You would uh, let them act in obedience and, and then they'll discover that the feelings follow obedience to you. But God, give us strong homes, give us healthy marriages, give us uh, loving friendships and help us to represent Jesus in every relationship that we have because that way we're furthering your kingdom. And you'll bless us as we bless others in your name. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray this, amen.